How do we characterize a post-apocalyptic world? It's usually characterized by a world in ruin, where the sophisticated monuments and structures of past civilizations are now in decay, never to be rebuilt. When much of the world's population has died, when the rules of law have become secondary to the whims of men, and when you are more likely to die of violent death than that of old age or disease. If this is what characterizes a post-apocalyptic world, then Britain in the 800s is one of the few times in our history where people truly lived under such circumstances. For nearly 400 years, the Romans had ruled over Britain, bringing with them their skills in masonry, weaponry, and trade. They constructed grand aqueducts, built roads, and founded grand cities, such as Londinium, or the modern-day city of London. Under the rule of the Romans, the island of Britain was largely unified. The once warring tribes learned to live in peace and prosperity. However, in the 4th century AD, the Romans abandoned the island of Britain, forced instead to focus their remaining strength on preventing the Western Roman Empire from collapsing. Following the Roman retreat, various tribes of Danish and Frankish warriors flooded the shores of Britain. What followed was the complete disintegration of the peaceful and prosperous region, which had once thrived. The world that the Romans had built was left in ruin and decay. Throughout Britain, the people marveled at the remains of Roman structures, massive monuments reminding the people of Britain of a time when life had been better and more prosperous. The ability to construct grand walls, roads, and stone buildings was now forgotten. People instead lived in wooden hovels and made patchwork repairs to the collapsing Roman structures. The most valuable fortresses and roads were those which the Romans had left behind nearly 400 years ago. The buildings of the day were fortunate to last even 30 years. And for the citizens of Britain, the world was about to get even darker. For on the horizon, a new threat was looming. An army coming to rape, plunder, and kill set their sights on the divided British kingdoms. They would be known to the British as the Great Heathen Army, but they would be known to us as the Vikings. This is Grim Battalia, and you're watching my documentary on the Great Heathen Invasion, The Fall of the First Kingdom, Assault on Northumbria. In the 400 years following the fall of British Rome, the people of the island faced a relentless assault by the tribes of Europe. It was during this time that Britain became an island of Anglo-Saxons. The Anglo-Saxons were tribes that once lived in modern-day France, Germany, and Denmark. Through 400 years of waging relentless war and persecution, they came to replace much of the original Bretonians. By the year 840 AD, on the eve of the great heathen invasion, Britain had completely transformed from the days of Roman rule. The island was divided into several kingdoms, the most prominent being Wessex, Mercia, Northumbria, and East Anglia. The Christian kingdoms were ever divided, and constantly waging war for superiority on the island. However, the time would soon come when the kingdoms of Britain would either have to unite or face the very same destruction which their ancestors had wrought on the British of old. In the year 844, a Viking chieftain named Ragnar Lodbrok would lead a series of devastating raids on West Francia the successor kingdom to the kingdom of Charlemagne. Ragnar sacked countless Frankish cities and concluded his raids with the burning of Paris. These events would mark the beginning of the great Viking Age in Europe. Twenty years would pass and Ragnar would find himself shipwrecked off the coast of Northumbria, the northernmost kingdom of Anglo-Saxon Britain. Ragnar was well known and feared by the British kingdoms and he was promptly captured by King Alia. The Vikings were despised by the Anglo-Saxons and thus King Alia ordered that Ragnar be executed by being thrown into a pit of venomous snakes. Little did he know that by doing so, he'd be sowing the fate of his kingdom for centuries to come. Deep in Scandinavia, the three sons of Ragnar swore vengeance against the Anglo-Saxons. Ivar the Boneless, Halfdan Ragnarsson, and Uber Ragnarsson gathered a horde of Vikings and set their eyes on Britain. While these leaders may have been encouraged by their dreams of vengeance, the Vikings who followed them likely had very different motivations. Those would range wildly, from simply wanting to settle new claimed and fertile lands, to wanting to raid and claim great wealth, or to simply wanting to earn reputation amongst their people. In the year 866, the Vikings set sail and landed on the shores of East Anglia. With this, the great heathen invasion began. The next century of British history would be defined by the relentless assault wrought by the Viking invaders. Once they landed, the Viking Halfdan Ragnarsson to 
took overall command of the Danish forces. The king of East Anglia quickly paid Raftan a small ransom in order for the Vikings to depart their lands without any fight or bloodshed ne being necessary. While Northumbria, and indeed most of the kingdoms of Britain, were woefully unprepared for the raiding tactics employed by the Danes, Ragnar and his men had chosen the perfect time to launch their invasion. In 866, the kingdom of Northumbria was divided by civil war. The lords of the land had divided and were preparing to engage in a battle to determine the fate of the kingdom. However, when the lords saw the scale of the Viking invasion that landed on Brit British shores, they defied the odds and struck a truce. The willingness of these warring lords to put aside their differences and work together truly demonstrated the danger that this invasion posed. Ragnar took his men and departed to East Anglia. His Vikings would march straight for the city of York in the hopes of capturing it and turning it into their Viking headquarters. With the city garrison off to participate in the civil war, the Danes were quickly able to capture the city and began to fortify the location. The city of York was an excellent place to make their headquarters. The river that fed into the city would allow the Danes to have access to the sea and gave them the ability to raid the countryside with ease, and perhaps even more importantly, it would allow reinforcements to join their invasion force. Of course, there are many cities with rivers located within Northumbria, but York was special due to its walls. York still retained much of its ancient stone Roman fortifications around its borders. These walls were far superior to the wooden palisades which the Europeans of this era knew how to build. And beyond the outer wall of the city, York had a fortified Roman castle situated deep within the city center. The Danes had quickly taken the city, but their army was in need of supplies. Rather than defending the city walls, many of the Danes head into the countryside to conduct raids and gather supplies for the soldiers garrisoned within. While the Danish raiders were away, the combined Northumbrian forces arrived at the city and set upon liberating it and driving the Danes out of Britain. The Danes moved to the city walls to prepare a defense, and upon seeing this, the Northumbrians quickly realized that the city was underdefended. The Northumbrian army stared at the walls of York, and they noted that many of the walls were destroyed in disrepair. The Danes had lacked the know-how to repair the wall, and this left their defenses exposed. The Danish army, sensing the danger, quickly moved to position and tried to defend the gaps in the wall. The Northumbrians quickly ordered an assault, and their men pushed forward, hoping to forge the gaps. The two forces fought in tight formation, with the Danish holding the choke points. Using the shield wall formation, the Danes fought as one giant unit, and they were difficult to push from their positions. However, the Northumbrians had superior forces, and they sent forward reinforcements to attack the undefended walls or destroy other weakened portions and soon they began to flood into the city. The Danes were comprised of experienced warriors who were skilled in the art of battle. And with this experience, despite being outnumbered, they were able to defeat many of the Northumbrian forces. But soon, the overwhelming numbers of the Northumbrians was too much, and the Danes began to fall back. The Northumbrians followed in hot pursuit, and soon the Danes were cornered inside the inner citadel of the city of York. The Northumbrians believed that they had the Danes trapped within the citadel, and soon the entire force would be driven from Britain. But it was at this moment that the Danes sprung a trap. The Danes had purposely left the walls of York unrepaired and revealed their inferior numbers in the hopes of drawing the Northumbrian army into an attack. The soldiers believed that the Danes had been off raiding, but they were actually waiting in a forest nearby the city. They waited for the Northumbrians to fully commit their forces so that they could launch a hammer and anvil attack on the exposed Northumbrian flank. The Northumbrians, seeing this, desperately tried to retreat, but it was too late. The Danes from the Citadel flocked out, and the Northumbrian army became completely trapped between the two Danish forces. What had started off as a battle now became a slaughter, as the Northumbrians desperately tried to push past each other and escape the carnage. But there would be no escape, and the Danes moved forward from both sides it completely destroyed the Northumbrian army, leaving the kingdom completely exposed and both kings of the Northumbrians dead on the battlefield. With the Danish victory over the Northumbrians, the kingdom would fall. 
the Danes would install their own puppet leader, who while nominally British, would in fact be subservient to them and would pay them gold, taxes, and food in order to maintain his position on the throne. With that, the nation of Daneland was officially born, and over the coming years, they would launch relentless attacks into the kingdoms of East Anglia, Mercia, and Wessex, hoping to displace the British and coin the island all for their own. However, one man would stand in their way. Alfred the Great of Wessex would serve as the last beacon of hope and light for the people of Britain, and through his actions, he would become the only British leader to ever gain the epithet, the Great. This was Grim Battalia. Let me know in the comments below if you want to see more on this series of the Great Heathen Invasion. For those who are interested in my series in the American Revolution, don't worry, there are more videos on that still coming. So please, if you're a fan or if you liked the video or you just want to support the channel, leave a like or a comment below and subscribe. And as always, I hope you enjoyed the video and please never stop learning.